welcome to another episode of the Being and Doing podcast, where I try to create a space for the unique minds that are all around us and to bring their stories that will hopefully change or inspire or challenge some of your views about reality and the world. And tonight I have with me Dr. Luis Cosolino, uh, which, as I said just before we started this interview, is uh, a sort of a personal hero. So this would be a first. Uh, and the reason I am really, I really admire Dr. Cosolino is that he is one of those poet scientists that he kind of describes in in one of his books, and. Uh, in addition to his immense expertise, what I observe from all the interviews I have watched, there is this expertise is backed up by a wonderful and warm personality. And this is the reason that I really wanted uh, Dr. Cosolino on this podcast. And I hope you will be, and I will, I hope I will be able to actually bring uh, my impression uh, through this conversation to, to all of you. So welcome, Dr. Cosolino, and really I'm grateful that you accepted this invitation. My pleasure to be with you. Thanks for so, having me. I will start by just asking you a simple question of what are the few words, uh, it can be nouns or adjectives, that you would describe yourself with? Hmm. A few adjectives. I would, the first thing that comes to mind is curious. Um, the second, I guess, something that I aspire to is um, empathy and compassion. And um, I, so I guess my, my, my studies and also the, the writings, I, I try to combine, I try to comp combine information with compassion and hopefully that, you know, those two things together result in some sort of wisdom that uh, will benefit other people. And I would like to uh, get on the curiosity. So um, why I love about curiosity is that kind of keeps us in this open state of mind. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is, as we know, important in therapy. So I'm curious uh, how you are cultivating this openness and this state of constant questioning. Um, I guess, you know, probably the roots of it are, is from my childhood growing up around people who were incredibly certain about their perspectives and obviously wrong right, to everyone except themselves. So I think from very early in life, I was impressed by how deluded human beings are. And I, I guess I came to appreciate also how deluded I must be. And so it's just this, um, my attraction to science, I think, is, is the hope of figuring out some sort of a methodology where we can we can sort of work around our human biases because our, you know, our brains, the human brain, as far as I can tell evolutionarily, the brain evolved to believe. It didn't evolve to, to know or to think, you know, uh, rationally. And so all, all of us humans have this real handicap because what we're looking for are simple answers to complex questions to relieve our anxiety uh, about our ignorance, right? So I think, the, the, it, and so that's a piece of it. And the other piece of it, I don't really know where it came from. I just, I just found uh, in contrast to many people that I know, and there must just, must just be part of biodiversity. Like some people are just endlessly curious about everything. And that's, and that's something that I've never had to cultivate. That's something that has always been true for me. And it, it was a problem early in life because I kept uh, bouncing from one study to another, from one major to another. I think I had four majors in my first year of college. And um, so I, I think that there's this sort of experiential component. And then there's a sort of natural, which I guess must be like some sort of genetically mediated thing that just makes me never accept the answers 
that, uh, that I'm given. And so I've always been attracted to people who, um, and, and, and my, my idols are, you know, or, or my heroes are people, you know, like Carl Rogers, like uh, Oliver Sacks, um, E.O. Wilson, uh, people like that who, who really, uh, in the face of all sorts of other, uh, or sort of, of other perspectives that were dominating the scientific scene, were actually able to take a deep dive into something that was very unique to them and a very unique expression of who they are. Um, Oliver Sacks, for example, he was a, a neurology resident at UCLA about five years before I got there. And all I ever heard about Oliver was how upset he made everyone because he was never, he never really presented what you expected him to present. And he was never, and his, his notes were always disorganized. His patient charts were lost often. Um, he was just always in his head thinking about the next you know, the next horizon or the next uh, world. And uh, he, he didn't do very well day to day. You know, um, he didn't please the people around him who had OCD. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, there are two questions that stem from this. One for me is, um, in terms of curiosity and the, the difficulty to handle the anxiety of uncertainty, I was uh, actually wondering, in, in one of your lectures, you were talking about, I don't want to be called expert, I want you to question me as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, can we somehow go towards a society which will constantly question, but still keep a certain level of stability? Because in one place, we, we need to make decisions fast and people who are longer in an area will eventually kind of be able to do that faster than others. And then mm -hmm. on the other hand, we still want to teach people how to question things and how to um, always uh, listen to themselves. So I'm just wondering what's your take on this um, and how we can implement it in, in society in a, in a better way. Yeah. Well, I, I, maybe the problem is with the word expert connotes that that's, that's the, the final word. Mm -hmm. And yet over and over and over in my experience, the experts are the block to new, you know, to new ways of thinking, to new learning. One of my favorite examples of that was um, was a fellow who used to, I think he was the editor of the Journal of Neuroscience, which was the, the sort of the key, uh, the key journal um, at the time. And they, his belief was, and the dogma, the standing dogma was that there was no genesis, neurogenesis in the human brain. Mm. And he wouldn't accept any articles or publish any articles that had findings that showed neurogenesis in the human brains. And I think um, I think it was Elizabeth Phelps and a number of other. It was interesting. It was all young women who found data or support for this notion of, of human neurogenesis. And finally, he just, you know, sort of did a, um, a begrudging acknowledgement. Right. So I think that that's the type of expertise that is um, something I call hardening of the categories. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it also stifles work and it, it in, um, and I felt the same way. I was uh, really, uh, you know, because I had a theory early on from my from my work that uh, in schizophrenia, schizophrenia involved uh, hippocampal disorganization. Uh, you know, neurons, uh, especially pyramidal cells, uh, being disorganized in the in the hippocampus. And everyone I submitted the paper to just said, you know, that you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, you know, it was like this isn't the, you know. And then, of course, a few years later, one of my teachers, uh, uh, Dr. Scheibel, discovered with one of his students uh, hippocampal pyramidal disorganization. And I wasn't I wasn't doing the biological research. I was looking at the animal research and the, the clinical research from schizophrenics. I said there's too much of an overlap between the behavioral manifestations to not think there's something not going on here. So, you know, that's why I, I think I really encourage my students to... Um, you know, I tell all of them, don't believe anything that I say, mm -hmm. you know, just um, consider it, play with it, because a lot of the things I was taught by the experts is now wrong. 
So just keep an open mind. So I think um, the, the, the question you're asking about how do we stay, how do we stay sort of balanced and, and be uncertain simultaneously, I think it takes a, a sort of a bit of, of, of uh, personal security. Like you can't, you can't base your own, your own safety and security on certainty. You have to base it on your ability to to deal with whatever comes and have confidence in yourself that you'll be able to develop new hypotheses and new decisions based on new data. Right. So I think that's the scientific perspective. That's actually uh, since I'm as well a scientist, um, it's something I'm really thinking about is how do we work with the young minds? in a way that we don't inhibit them, that we actually uh, nurture the potential we have in society. Because what I often observe in science is that there is a lot of struggle for the young minds, for the gifted minds to actually overcome what you would call the hardening of the categories. So I'm, I'm just wondering, basically, do you observe a shift um, in, in this sense, or it's just something that you were able to build for yourself and your students? And if so, how did you build that? What is it that you model for your students uh, so that they feel safe to question you? Well, I mean, I think I, I started this um, with, my, with my son, who's now 14. I started when he was very young, you know, just saying, He'd ask me a question and I would say, here's what I think, but that's my opinion. And I, you know, and I'm often wrong. Let's check it out. So then we would go to the computer or go to the dictionary or the encyclopedia or whatever resources that we have. So it's, it's backfired a little bit because now when I say anything to him, he says, well, dad, you know, you're often wrong. Right. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, the education, the schools that he's gone to, which I've been able to select, have, are, are schools that have that perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's a piece of it. And I do the same thing in a different way in my own in my classes is I, um, you know, first of all, I, I tell people like, here's here's the current state of the art. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'll present, you know, I talk if I talk about attachment te theory, for example, I'll say, well, this is the theory. And here are the strengths and, and the things that are attractive about it. But on the other hand, I don't think you can reduce attachment to these categories and you see that there's plasticity in these categories over time. And so these are adaptational patterns. So don't get too attached to attachment theory. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's the same thing if they're talking about consciousness or, you know, um, you know, Crick had a theory of consciousness. There are, there are dozens of theories of consciousness. Um, none of them have convinced me, but they're all interesting. Right. And so it's really, I think, a matter of um, th this came as I'm thinking about it. It, it came to me um, when I started him as an undergraduate. I studied um, philosophy and I focused on um, ancient Indian philosophy. And one of the things that I I I, I don't know, it was my maybe it was my teacher's pe uh, peculiar interpretation, but he talked about um he talked about the ancient practices in India. The idea was that every every um, reality sort of arises, and there's this notion in, of Sanskrit of interdependent uh, co-origination. In other words, everything sort of arises together in a complex system, and then those things. And if you go to another system, you have a whole nother set of variables, right? Um, and I think that was true in ancient India. Many of my professors who studied at the University of Chicago talked in terms about different mindsets or different world hypotheses, like an existential hypothesis or a theological hypothesis. Depending on the grounding of reality, you built this whole edifice of, of ideas and logical connections, but it was all predicated on these initial assumptions from which it arose. So I think all through my education and what I try to do with my students is to get them to realize that everything is dependent and relative on a particular conceptual frame, right? And you can't spend, and I let us like, well, people will say Christianity is the same as Buddhism because look, you can talk about compassion in both. And I say, well, that's true. You can talk about uh, compassion in both, but they're completely different frames of reference grounded in 
very different from traditions with different philosophies and logic, right? So it's important to see the connections, but it's also important to see the differences, right? Yeah, and actually there I had a question because when I was, whenever I was thinking about um, mental health and, and also how we see the world, I always felt that basically our personal philosophy is what holds this view. And, and almost like if you don't question those assumptions, that are on the basis of one's philosophy, we cannot mm -hmm. really build a new world. So I'm right. curious, um, how do you help um, patients to actually understand this concept that, that, that it's not such a rigid uh, state, our world, that the worldview is not such a rigid place actually? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of, um, I use narrative a lot as a model and the ability to edit narratives. And I also think in terms of the, uh, the myth of the hero, mm -hmm. you know, Joseph Campbell's idea, Jung's idea, um, uh, thinking in terms of, you know, you have, you live your life based on a set of assumptions and stories, many of which were written by your culture and your family. And some of those fit you well, and maybe others don't, mm -hmm. you know, I see this a lot when I work with, uh, work with women, for example, whose, uh, whose personal, uh, they're personally striving to learn more and to be, you know, be in the world and be more powerful, yet their family narratives are all about them having a husband chosen for them and being a housewife and a mother. And um, I must share here, I'm sorry, even my sure. friend once told me, she told me like, you're this incredible scientist, but you were brought up as a housewife. And, right. I, and it's incredible to see even in myself how much, even though you, you, you strive for something different, your makeup is completely um, already conditioned in a different way. Right, right. And so I think what that leads to, in other words, you can, um, you know, for example, if you were, if you were my client, you might, you might, you know, leave everything about being a mother and a, and a wife behind because you're, you're focusing so much on being a scientist and that satisfies some needs, mm. but it doesn't satisfy other Others, needs, yeah. right? And if all you have is an either or narrative, right? Then what happens is that you start becoming symptomatic to the degree to which you're not really writing a narrative that's as, that's as complex as you are, Yeah. right? And so that's what I think, you know, as far as a the therapy is concerned is to be able to figure out like, how would you and I write a narrative together that would attempt to balance the multiple things that you are? And, you know, in realizing there are going to be some ways in which being a mother or a wife or a housewife is going to conflict with being a scientist. But it's not impossible to do those two things. It's just impossible given your maybe your mother or your grandmother. Mm. Right. Because it was sort of an either or, or world. And, you know, living in Los Angeles I mean, more than half the people in Los Angeles come from another country. And so I'm constantly, you know, dealing. everyone comes from all over the world with their more traditional belief systems. And if they're in Los Angeles, they also have this desire to do something different. Otherwise, they would be back on a farm or in the, you know, in their in their village, wherever they, you know, wherever their family came from. And so I think that really, if you can, if you could start seeing the, you know, what I see is the or the human brain and society co-evolved with narratives, right? And narratives are a very important part of society and also how we regulate, you know, our own brains. And, and it's almost like an external neural circuit, you know, narratives, because they play such a strong role in neural integration and also like a guidance system to, to help us through the day and through our lives. And so, in a sense, there's an educational component to therapy to help people realize that and to realize that they actually can make choices about their narrative as opposed to either accepting or rejecting in a binary fashion what their mothers told them. Yeah, and actually there is something that I find as well interesting in therapies is the creativity of it. And at the end of, a, I feel like a successful therapy, you feel you have the possibility to create worlds and suddenly the complexity doesn't bother you anymore. So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of creativity, we can come back to that later. Before I forget, um, 
in one of your lectures, you say that you cannot um, have a successful therapy without both cognition and emotion processing. And we talked about narrative, which is more in the cog cognitive domain, but uh, how do you tackle or how do you work with the bodily and emotive part? Well, I mean, I think that the narrative, the, a narrative is an integrative function. It mm. is cognitive, it is left hemisphere, it is sequential, um, you know, so it's, it's a left, left frontal language process on the one hand, but also narratives don't make any sense without emotion, mm -hmm. right? And without the body, I mean, the myth of the hero, or the, the journey, hero's journey is a very physical process where you have to go through, you know, you climb mountains, you, you, you go through the swamps of despair, you do all of those things. And in the process of the narrative, all sorts of emotions get generated. And so I use those to, um, you know, to, to sort of look into and, you know, and dive deeper into the feelings. In other words, like you have all of you have these ideas or these or your self-image that is keeping you from experimenting or risking being yourself. So what emotions get generated when you imagine um, when you imagine betraying your mother by being a scientist, mm -hmm. right? What fear, you know, there's abandonment fear, there's shame, there's despair, there's a sense of, oh, I can never go home again. I'm going to be completely alone and I'm going to all die old alone in my apartment with a bunch of cats. And all of that stuff <laughs> generates all sorts of emotions, right? That then you can, you can work through. And of course, a lot of times people get frozen too because they've been traumatized in some way. You know, they've been uh, physically or sexually abused or uh, they've had some horrible experience. In that. Many people, at least in L.A., you know, have come through, uh, you know, political, political, uh, you know, they've been in, in uh, one of my clients was in a building in, um, I think, in Kosovo, where the, um, you know, the, the building next door where her little friends lived was destroyed. And so she's hanging on to a wall. Of a, of a floor that's now at a 45 degree angle, you know, it's like trying to yell through the dust and the noise to try to find her mother. I mean, um, you know, that will make people freeze and solidify and stop growing. Yeah. You know, that it, that's a, there's a fight, flight and a freeze, freeze. response as well. Yeah. And so people can freeze for decades or they can free their whole lives. Another manifestation of trauma is is tending, which is a really interesting one where um, it's kind of like the, the Stockholm syndrome, where the people that uh, that basically are abusing you, you become their caretaker. Yeah. And so it's another way to get stuck and to um, it, it's another freeze response, although it doesn't look like it doesn't look the same. Yeah, those are very, very familiar for me because you mentioned Kosovo and, and I'm from Serbia. So we have, as I feel as, as a collective, we are in a freeze state and yeah. it's, it takes time. Yeah. Um, actually, you mentioned uh, expressing yourself. Um, so, and when you say self, I'm always interested in this question of authenticity and what does it mean to express the self? So what, what do you, what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I mean, I think, I, I, I think when I think about self, I naturally think of identity. Mm -hmm. right? And I like Daniel Dennett's definition um, of, of identity. He, call, he says that identity is the center of narrative gravity. Mm -hmm. So it's the stories that we tell about ourselves or how we view ourselves. And those stories are both helpful and hurtful because they they provide a foundation and a direction, but they also can create limits. Right. So I think as far as as far as expanding the self, one of the one of the ways in which I work with folks is and I work with myself is trying to and this is kind of hard to articulate, but it's it's trying to learn to listen to the inner voices. And the voices may not be words, it may be feelings that may be intuitions or impulses or, you know, in other words, what, um, like Joseph Campbell talked about following your bliss, mm -hmm. right? 
what is it that, you know, what is it that makes you feel alive? Where, you know, like the, you know, for many people, especially people who have children, they describe when their babies were young and they would have their baby on their chest and they would feel their baby fall asleep and they would listen to their baby breathing and they would smell that wonderful smell from the tops of their heads and all. And they would just feel and they would feel so safe themselves, making the child feel safe. And I think that you have that feeling of there's no place I'd rather be or there's no place that would be better for me to be or more important for me to be. Right. And I think that it's those types of feelings. And oddly enough, I have that feeling. I had that feeling with my son, but also I have that feeling with neuroscience. Like I wake up in the morning and it's like, what new can I learn today? Mm -hmm. And it never gets old for me, you mm -hmm. know? So I think discovering neuroscience, you know, in, you know, when I was studying theology, for example, you know, was just like, it's like, um, I was, it didn't fit into my narrative. Mm -hmm. Right. It didn't make any sense to anyone around me. All I knew is that every day I wanted to learn a little bit more about the brain. And so then I had to like re uh, readjust my narrative. Right. And so uh, on the other hand, someone could say, listen, you're a theology student. You should be a minister or you should be a priest and you shouldn't study neuroscience because that's just going to delay. And if I did that, then I might find that I would become symptomatic because I'm cutting off a part of myself that I naturally, you know, have an instinct or a tendency towards. So I think, you know, uh, just to, to, in a nutshell, it's the, it's opening ourselves up to, um, to those feelings and to those in, impulses and value, learning to value them and really looking at the narratives that we have as not absolute, but as something that we can constantly edit. And actually, coming back to, to all this wide-ranging um, experiences you had, um, I'm curious, um, was there a point of fear and insecurity where, when is all of this going to merge? Where is all of this going to feel like now I'm using all of my capacities? Because sometimes for gifted people I feel they're they often feel out of place because they they can do much more and then um, it's at point it feels like as you described alone very alone uh, lonely sorry um so I'm curious how was your process in integrating all these parts or these curious parts of you which in some way had to be satiated um, mm. And and was there fear, or for you this was just natural part of curiosity? Well, there was fear, certainty. Uh, I mean, certainly, as far as you know, would I ever would I ever be able to develop a, enough of a of a singular identity mm. where I could support myself? So I think it was that had I been you know had I been a wealthy a wealthy person had I been born rich. I could see spending my life. I would have built a house. I would have been like, uh, you know, um, you know, like a medieval scientist in my in my laboratory. With a Renaissance my, man. Yeah, yeah. I would have my little telescope and my microscope, and I would just be, you know, growing peas out in the garden and doing all of these things, dropping apples from trees to, you know, to look at gravity. Um, but I didn't have that luxury, so I really had to figure out how to um, how to make a living. So I think what I when I found clinical uh, sort of uh, psychotherapy as a potential profession, a lot of things clicked for me because I realized that not only was there a, were there a fairly discernible skills and a clear identity, but it was a situation where you could use anything else you've learned to your client's benefit. So it felt like a like a coming together. And I think one of the really important uh, milestones or, or 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 key points in my life was. When I, after getting my doctoral degree, I decided to get out of research academics mm. because research academics was so narrowing and there was so much pressure yeah. for grant writing and publishing and all of those things. I realized that I didn't have, I wouldn't have the freedom to live. So I, I took a job of teaching at a school where even as a doctoral student, I think I had published eight or nine articles as a doctoral student. And so I already had enough articles published for tenure. 
So I didn't have to worry about publishing for 10 years. So what I did was for 10 years after I graduated, for the most part, I read literature, mm -hmm. right? Because that was a part of my education that really had been, uh, you know, I had left that behind while I was in college studying these other things. And I knew that the best psychologists were authors. You know, I was never very impressed with the field of psychology as an intellectual endeavor, right? But, um, you know, uh, Vic, I've, for me, Victor Hugo is probably my, you know, the, the psychologist I aspire to most. And whenever I visit Paris, I always sit, I go to visit his, uh, his apartment at the Place de Vosges, and I sit on the floor reading some of Les Miserables right next to his writing desk. Oh, wow. That is That's beautiful. my inspiration. <laughs> wow. Well, I have that relationship with Dostoevsky, so I understand that level right. of connection. Um, and I want to get into uh, talking a little bit about therapy. So uh, in one of the talks, uh, you are talking about um, the important things for therapy is unconditional positive regard towards the client. And then the second part, which I find a little bit more interesting to go in depth, uh, is uh, a balance between um, a, a sense of safety and a stress. So I'm and 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 this is not only just for psychology it's also for for learn anything where we want to learn. So I'm I'm curious how do you sense that in a person you are working with when there is enough safety that you can challenge them and how do you actually challenge people in an effective manner? Well, I think the you know the Everyone's physiological arousal is different. They, they express it in different ways. So I think a lot of it is, um, is spending enough time with someone to get to know them mm -hmm. and to really ask those questions. And ask a lot, I ask a lot of questions about their internal states. You know, what are they feeling now? And, and, that it, and I also sometimes will use um, like a, a simple biofeedback device like a GSR galvanic skin response thing. And I'll just, and I'll, cause many people don't have any clue about how aroused they are, so they can't articulate it. Um, and so that becomes a way uh, uh, to, to build language around discussing how aroused they are. Um, some people are at a high level of arousal and, uh, and they, they vote, they're so anxious and their, their, their amygdalas are so, and their, their autonomic nervous systems are so hyper aroused that maybe their vagal systems are, are underdeveloped to the point where they can't really regulate their emotion. They're always at full speed. And so with those clients, very often, you know, I need to explore medication first mm -hmm. with them to see if we can't figure out a way to, to decrease their level of arousal. Um, and the reason why arousal for me is so primary, because I mean, my understanding of the literature is that um, at a certain level of arousal, and this will be different for everyone, is that the level of adrenaline and cortisol actually inhibits protein synthesis, mm -hmm. right? Which is going to lead to, um, to neuroplasticity inhibition. And my assumption is that if someone's going to change in psychotherapy, their brain has to have neuroplastic processes in order to learn new things. Um, another level of this, which is not identical, but certainly regulated, is that the amygdala inhibits the other two executive systems, one in the parietal frontal lobes and the other, the DMN, you know, in a, var a variety of medial brain systems. And you need both parietal frontal executive processing and DMN executive processing for self-reflection, for understanding interpretations, to be able to actually do the work where you can have change. I mean, that's where insight is. That's where self-reflection is in those other systems. And so the, the, I guess, the identification and an understanding of arousal and, and calming is an important first step. And then after that, the question, your next question was, you know, how do you challenge? And I think the challenges really are about assumptions. You know, for example, uh, if a person goes, um, if, you had, if you have four or five bad relationships in a row, and they all go bad in somewhat the same way, yet you've dated very different people. You know, 
the the first the way our brains are organized is we try to figure out what's wrong with each of those people, right? We don't think, well, I'm the common element here. Are there some ways in which I'm responsible, or or my own inner world is involved in this? And so that's that's a challenge, mm. right? And there are people, for example, people that are labeled borderline very very often. They can't attain the level of of uh, of regulation, of affect regulation, to tolerate those types of challenges. Mm -hmm. So those are the people that get up and storm out of the office and slam the doors and, you know, act out and do sorts, all sorts of other things. And so there's this, there's this double, this double function as far as regulating arousal. One is enhancing plasticity or allowing plasticity to take place. The other is to allow our three executive systems to be regulated, communicate with each other, and uh, and integrate as as an aspect of plasticity. And I'm curious there as well. Um, you talk about affect regulation and also calming and soothing. And in in one uh, of the of the books, uh, I came across something that I experienced, which was that sometimes I, for example, through yoga or meditation, you. Um, try to soothe and regulate but actually I realized that's not what I need to be doing now now I actually need to be very angry and uh, and need to be uh, aroused because I don't allow that for myself so right. I'm I'm actually curious uh, about this because we somehow um, I feel tend to uh, want to eliminate these aroused state in in kind of in the culture at this particular moment and and i'm 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 curious what's your take on this because i feel like this is like the new way of trying to in a way um neglect the negativity that actually is useful sometimes yeah well, well i think there's a couple of things um well probably the most important thing is that people confuse rage and anger mm -hmm. right Rage is a right hemisphere uh, function that is very primitive. That is that is a is a reaction to being hurt, or being misunderstood, or abandoned. Right? Uh, maybe not abandoned, but you know that that sense of of being wronged mm -hmm. and of being shamed. So shame and shame and rage go very hand in hand. Um, anger, on the other hand, is is really a, a left hemisphere function, and it co-evolved with attachment, mm -hmm. because not only do we have to feed and shelter our young, we also have to protect them from danger, and sometimes we have to fight off other people, right? I think that therapists, for the most part, at least in my experience, are conflict avoidant, so yeah. they tend to lump anger in with shame, and they don't help their, they try to manage anger as opposed and decrease it as opposed to understand when it's appropriate right and so i think that's an important distinction the anger rage distinction and the positive social aspects of, of anger because you don't want people taking advantage of you and you also don't want people hurting your loved ones or yourself right so that's the first piece of it another piece of it is that we've inherited a hierarchical um primate system having to do with that, you know, where we're alphas, alphas and betas and omegas, right? And part of, part of being an alpha is being in touch with your anger, mm. right? And again, your anger, it isn't, it isn't to be abusive of other people. It isn't to dominate other people. It's simply to assert yourself in a situation and get what is your share of whatever is available, right? And so if you swallow your anger, if you don't let your anger um, be expressed when it's appropriate, that again, symptoms occur. People become, they get somatic, you know, the conversion disorders, um, they become depressed. Freud called, you know, um, depression was anger turned inward. There's truth to that, right? Um, so there are all of these aspects and, and we're all, because we're all primates, we all have this, we all exist in this hierarchical alpha, beta, omega, structure, even if we don't want to believe it, we live in it, right? And so another ad, another added problem for that for women uh, is that women are told that it's, you know, that if you're angry, you're a bitch. A bit, exactly. Yeah, right? Yeah. 
And so then there's all that, like, you don't want to be a bitch, don't do you? Like, no man will ever want you. And so there are all of the, and again, that's the narrative. You know, it's like really important for women to learn how to be bitches. Yeah. Right. In the, in the most positive version right. of the term. Right. And it also like with John Lewis, the, the, you know, the, the congressman who died last year. And, you know, he always talked about getting in good trouble. It's important to get in trouble for a good cause. Just like, you know, and people are very conflicted about this. And then I'll say, well, and I'll ask men and women the same question. I'll say, okay, let's imagine that you're out for a walk. You're in a park with your children, right? Or your child. And you're talking to someone else, a friend, and you notice that there's someone trying to grab your child and abduct them. What are you going to do? And these very nice, sophisticated, repressed people will say, I'll rip their goddamn head off. Yeah. Right. And my response is exactly right. It's a it's an appropriate response. And so I think that we've got we really have a reckoning um, in, in not only in psychotherapy, but as a culture to address the thing that you said, which is that it's really important to be angry. Right. But the anger has to be within a, a moral framework. It, it, it can't be it can't be like what Trump does stirring yeah. up people who want to, like, destroy the Capitol building. That's just impotent rage. They're feeling taken advantage of. Right. The anger is getting angry at prejudice, getting angry at the. You know, and when you think about what's coming ahead of us over the next 50 years with climate change, there's going to be incredible mass migration, yeah. you know, around the world. People trying to get away from places that are going to be inhabitable in 50 years. And this is really going to test our, you know, compassion versus our fear and, and, uh, and our old perceptions of what life is versus what we're going to have to create to move forward. Yeah. And just also to talk about therapy, I'm experiencing a, from a lot of my friends when I talk about therapy is that sometimes when I share my stories, they would say, oh my God, I'm not sure if I would go because I'm a little bit afraid of what I will discover. And uh, I'm curious to ask you this, what is the worst we can discover in therapy? Because that fear that we have, I feel like at the end, we only discover our humanness. So I'm curious, yeah, what's your take on this? Well, I, I think that... Um... I think that our humanness lies on the other side of our grief. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people say they're afraid of what they'll discover, I think what they're afraid with their, what most of them mean is that um, they're going to have to go through all of the painful feelings that they've managed to figure out how to keep out of consciousness. Mm. And so everybody sort of has a demon down in the basement of their castle, you know, and every once in a while they hear it howling and shaking the bars. And that's what they're afraid of. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, yeah, they're afraid of themselves because growing up is difficult, especially, especially if you grow up under difficult circumstances and either that's in your family or in your culture or, you know, you know, war, famine, catastrophe, whatever, genocide, um, there's a lot of pain and it isn't just our pain. It's the pain of our parents and the pain of our grandparents and our great grandparents. And so I understand the fear, you yeah. know, I certainly had it. And, um, you know, I mean, I think if your fear keeps you from going to therapy, your fear is going to keep you from a lot of things. Right. And I'm curious in, in a personal uh, manner, what's the like truth about life or, or a pain that you were, like mm, that you were unwilling to to look at for the longest of time like in a way your biggest resistance well i think the um i don't know i mean i think i think for me it was um my uh, you know it, it has to do with abandonment and it has to do with uh with death you know and, you know, my in the depths of my therapy, what I got to was the fact that my, when my father had me when he was 19 or 20 and I got the attention that he never got. Mm -hmm. And so he was very jealous and um, 
there was a lot, I had a lot of fear of him. You know, I was afraid he'd abandon me, but I was more afraid he'd kill me. Mm. Right. So that was at the core of a whole lot of issues. And in order to get there, there were many, many, many layers of, um, I don't know how to say dissociation, mm -hmm. um, you know, all layers of narcissistic defenses, you know, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I think that is, you know, I think at the core of er at the, at the core of everyone's, everyone's fear probably is abandonment because yeah. abandonment equals death for primates. Yes. And then that can take on thousands of different forms. Yeah. Yeah. But you always get, I, I always seen whenever I've worked with anyone, you get to that core feeling of, uh, of abandonment. And that, and however that manifests, shapes your career, it shapes your adult relationships, it shapes your friendships, and it shapes your narrative and self, you know, self image. So just to be mindful of your time, I have two more questions. So one of them is, um, what do you, um, how do you conceptualize success, either in life or in therapy? Oh, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, I, I think it's a matter of, like I said at the early on, like learning that vulnerability is a strength, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a, that's a core piece because if you can be, if you can feel strong in your vulnerability, then life is livable, mm. right? You don't have to be acting. You can just be yourself and discover who you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and that's true in therapy and in life, you know, like Freud said, the, the purpose of therapy isn't, um, isn't to rub off every sharp edge of a person, right? The purpose of therapy is to get over the defenses and the resistances that keep you from loving and working. Mm. So if you can love and work, that's good enough for me, right? You know, uh, life life is very fragile and very chaotic. We're just animals. We're just biological organisms clinging to a, a rock that's flying through space. So you got to be careful not to get too um, fancy about what your dreams are. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the last one is, um, uh, I was uh, thinking about, basically the way I exercise and the way uh, I lift weights and how easy it is to conceptualize that process and say every day when I wake up I will put a little bit more weight and I know exactly what I'm exercising and then I kind of am able to shape that but when it comes to the mind we cannot have this progressive overload or maybe we can if we know enough and I'm curious if you if you have this idea of a mind map that would help us to understand what are we exercising in this particular moment. And your book actually really does that incredibly well. But I'm, I'm curious for the listeners, if you can make, maybe talk about this in a nutshell. Yeah, I would say, you know, to, in answer to that question, I would probably evoke like a Buddhist perspective mm -hmm. and just say, you know, our, our minds are sort of like a, a, an onion with, uh, with infinite layers. And so every day, it's important for us to unlearn something about ourselves, mm. you know, where we're open to new experiences. Like, how do you, how do you remain a child? You know, how do you become fascinated with, uh, with watching a, a bug crawl across the ground or, or the way sunlight bounces off of a certain, uh, you know, a certain piece of glass or something like that. I think that really is the, uh, you know, if we can, if we can, if, if every day we can have a moment where we can grasp a child's mind, right, and become a human doing as opposed to a human being, then I think we're doing as we're doing as well as can be expected. Yeah. And just the rapid fire questions to wrap up. So what is one um, one absurd thing about you that not many people know about? Absurd? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unexpected. God, I don't, I don't know if there's anything absurd about me. <laughs> that's also fine. The, that's yeah, I, I, I can't, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm sure there are. <laughs> I, I just am not thinking. I, I, um, one of the time that I feel most absurd is when I go to sleep at night, I have to wear a mouth guard, right? Oh, because okay. I grind my teeth. Okay. And then I have to wear a mask with a with a with an oxygen hose because I have apnea. Okay. So then I put that on and then I put a hood on and then over that I put a headphones 
because I usually listen to like a book on tape or something as I'm falling asleep. So if you saw me in bed at night, I'm sure you would think I was absurd because I look like I'm in an intensive care unit, right? Yeah, that's why I like these questions because a lot of these things come, come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one more is uh, if you are to interview someone alive or dead uh, and you haven't had the chance to talk with that person, who would that be? Oh, wow. God, so many people come to mind. So you can people. say several. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the first person that I would want to, um, and, I mean, Buddha came to mind first, but I don't think he would be very helpful. Um, <laughs> I think he would just smile at me uh, for asking questions. But I think I'd really be interested in talking to uh, Einstein. And not because I'm interested in physics per se, but because I'm really interested in the process of how he converted mathematical formulas into visual images and manipulate because I'm interested in the parietal lobes and how visual images and imagination take place. So he would be a first person. I did get to spend time with Temple Grandin, who was a who's an autistic uh, woman who's developed all of the uh, the, the the cattle processing. Oh, yes. Yeah, she wrote a great book called Thinking in Pictures. And so I did get a chance to spend time in an hour with her and talk to her and ask. So I'd like to ask Einstein the same questions I asked Temple. Wow. And well, we don't have time, but I would be curious to listen to the answers. <laughs> Next episode. Next episode. OK, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I actually do hope there will be some next episode once uh, when when your schedule is again cleared, because, yeah, I have many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's really been a pleasure, yeah. You have just heard the story of Dr. Luis Cusulino, a practicing psychotherapist and professor at Pepperdine University in LA. He's lecturing around the world on psychotherapy, neuroscience, trauma, and attachment. His primary method as a therapist is one of connection, attunement, and interaction. If you want to connect with him, you can find him on Instagram at Dr. Cusulino and Co. or read more in depth about his work on www.drlucozzolino.com and find his books on Amazon and other bookstores. Thank you for joining me for this episode and I hope you will come along with me on this journey.